Out of the darkness of post-war Japan rose a style of photography that was raw, impulsive, and iconoclastic. The Japanese economic miracle was well underway, with the island nation poised to become a superpower. But the price of progress was not borne equally, and friction was unavoidable. Some took up the pen to make sense of these turbulent times, others the camera. The camera became a tool of rebellion, tearing down institutions, societal norms, and the very medium of photography itself. Perhaps the most influential photographer of this time is Daido Moriyama. In this video, we'll learn about his unique vision of photography, and then we'll put it into practice on the streets. Daido Moriyama was born as Hiromichi Moriyama, near Osaka, in 1938. Growing up, he moved around a lot because of his father's job, and every time he moved, he would wander the streets, exploring his new surroundings. Later in life, this restless wandering would become a staple of his photographic routine. But Moriyama didn't always want to become a photographer. He originally aspired to join the Navy, but he failed the entrance exam and ended up working as an industrial designer and photography assistant. In 1961, he moved to Tokyo and became an apprentice to Eiko Hosoi, one of Japan's most promising young photographers. Under Hosoi, he assisted on some iconic projects, including the Ordeal by Roses series of portraits of Yukio Mishima. In the end, the studio wasn't Moriyama's real calling, but the darkroom skills he developed and artists he met through Hosoi would prove invaluable in his career. Moriyama went on to do his own freelance projects, trading the studio for the streets, and his early work depicted the fringes of Japanese society. He drew inspiration from other artists, not just photographers, but novelists, painters, and playwrights, and not just from Japan, but abroad. Two American artists whose photography had a major impact on Moriyama were William Klein and Andy Warhol. He writes, William Klein in many ways inspired me to be a photographer. His impact was decisive. In taking these pictures of the New York he knew, he was also taking apart all photography that previously existed. Japanese photographers like myself were able to begin because of what he did to deconstruct photography. Seeing Klein's raw and gritty vision of New York freed Moriyama up to pursue his own photography in a similar deconstructive direction. And you can see that frenetic energy echoed in his work. Likewise, the way Andy Warhol redefined what art could be inspired Moriyama to challenge photographic tradition in a similar fashion. This rebellious avant-garde spirit was very much in vogue at the time. During the 1960s, Japan was undergoing rapid economic and social change. The influx of mass media introduced new ideas, new values, and a new awareness of what Japan's place in the world should be, and what role the United States should play in that. Some of the largest protests in Japan's history broke out in the early 60s and 70s, sparked by opposition to treaties which allowed American military bases to continue to operate on Japanese soil. Seeing televised anti-war movements in Europe and North America emboldened Japanese protesters to take to the streets, factories, and university campuses across the country.
During this period of mass political and economic mobilization, there was a flowering of the arts, and photography was no exception. Moriyama photographed the unrest, but he remained politically neutral. In his words, all of Japan became very political. Everyone seemed to be rebellious, fighting against their art form, the world, and anything political. Young people used that feeling as motivation to express themselves. I didn't want to express a straightforward political message. I was more inspired by the feelings of rebellion and criticism that arose in our daily lives. These countercultural feelings were often condensed into printed form through small, independently published magazines. In 1968, two photographers, an art critic, and a poet came together to publish an experimental zine with an ambitious goal to provoke discussions around the very nature of photography. The publication had a brief production run with only three issues and Moriyama contributed photographs to the second and third issue. The images in Provoke were striking for their Areburebuke style, grainy, blurry, and out of focus. Alongside these images were poems, essays, and reflections on photography, artistic expression, and the immaterial world of language and ideas. Provoke rejected the structured realism of traditional documentary photography in favor of a more personal, subjective approach, foregoing external accuracy for internal resonance. The photographs were not really capturing what was being seen, but instead hinted at what was being felt, orbiting closer to the world of feelings than facts. As one curator eloquently put it, Proponents of the Provoke movement believed that reality and our experience of it is inherently fragmentary, and that photography's ability to capture fleeting moments made it the perfect medium in which to express this idea. The text in Provoke is cryptic, trammeled in purple prose, and a lot of it is lost in translation. When it was first published, a lot of people didn't get it, and many thought the photographs betrayed a lack of skill instead of some profound epiphany about photography. The group disbanded in 1970, but this short-lived zine would send ripples throughout Japanese photography circles. In the 80s and 90s, many young photographers would embrace Provoke's rebellious and experimental spirit. After Provoke disbanded, Moriyama stayed on this deconstructive path through his own published work, questioning and stripping away the trappings of photography in order to get closer to its essence. For Moriyama, the essence of photography lies not in its creative potential, but in its imitative potential. He maintained that there is no originality, no art in photography, because art involves making something from nothing and photography only makes copies or equivalents. That's why he has no qualms about photographing posters, TV screens, or his own printed images, making copies of copies. When Andy Warhol took the art world by storm with his pop art silk screen soup cans, it was a huge boon to Moriyama because it validated his own beliefs about the power of copies. there's certainly a democratization of photography with Moriyama, a kind of pop photography. He once said that if he were to define a photograph, it would be as a fossil of light and time. Much in the way a fossil is a record of the abrasions between bone and sedimentary rock, Moriyama's work has been described as a record of the traces of abrasion when the landscape grates roughly against the body. これはあの、すれ違う時にできる傷のことを言ってるんですが、え、森山さんの写真の中からあ、その、作家賞のようなものがですね、時代とすれ違った時のえ、が感じられるというのが、あ、この作家という言葉になって結びついてきてるんじ
Sometimes flaws make things feel more real. His work feels very tangible, very tactile, and you really start appreciating this when you flip through his photo books. They're often structured haphazardly in a stream of consciousness fashion. Trying to interpret the sequencing of images feels like trying to piece together memories of a drunken night out on the town. The printed pages gain a life of their own, and the more photo books of his you read, the less you try to make sense of it. You just have to let go and appreciate the sensory quality of it all. There's a photographic language here that transcends words. The same images are often republished in different orders, in different books, creating different meanings. Just like how the same kanji can be read differently depending on its placement, its context. Moriyama's birth name, Hiromichi, is written the same way as his artist name, Daido but it's read differently. So, in a sense, his work is a physical embodiment of himself. Messy and rough around the edges, but full of latent energy. All of this sounds very abstract, but what is Moriyama's style in practical terms? It's perhaps best embodied in his most famous photograph, Stray Dog. Moriyama thinks of himself as a stray dog, he says. I consider the style of my own street snaps as scraping up and snatching all kinds of views of all kinds of people and scenes I encounter on the street. At the back of my mind, I am biting at everything in the external world. And this is consistent with Moriyama's unpretentious approach to street photography. He doesn't think of himself as someone who's documenting the human condition or capturing beautiful moments for future generations. No, he's a stray dog wandering aimlessly from street to street, scavenging for scraps. No planning, no real goal, just following his gut, his desire. Moriyama moves at a brisk pace and shoots unselectively, taking snapshots of whatever catches his eye without giving much thought to theme, narrative, or composition. He's been known to use up an entire roll of film in less than 100 meters. For Moriyama, quality only comes with quantity. You can probably tell by now that Moriyama is someone who doesn't care too much about gear, who values simplicity over technical prowess. He advocates shooting with small, pocketable cameras, because they don't get in the way. Point-and-shoot cameras free him up to photograph with his entire body. He can shoot with the viewfinder or with no viewfinder. He can hold the camera up to his eye, or down to his hip, or out to the side without having to worry about settings. This makes him seem more casual, less intrusive. Being a man of convenience and free of dogmas, Moriyama switched to digital and color photography when it became feasible. But I feel that his digital work is too clean, too sterile, and lacks the grit and physicality of his analog work. So for this video, I'm going to shoot film. I'll be using the small portable Olympus XA and shooting on Kodak Tri-X 400 film. Looking through Moriyama's contact sheets, this is a film stock he used often. We touched on Arebure Boke earlier, grainy, blurry, out of focus. Many of Moriyama's early works exhibit this style with high contrast deep shadows, and crushed blacks. In order to increase the grain and contrast of my pictures, I'll be pushing the film to 800 and 1600 ISO. The XA is an aperture priority camera, so I don't have manual control of the shutter speed. Because of this, if I want to introduce blur, I'll just avoid keeping my hands too steady when pressing the shutter. 
Instead, I can hold the camera with one hand and let it follow the natural motion of my body. Like Moriyama, I'll shoot with and without the viewfinder, following what my gut tells me. If the image is out of focus, it's okay. So we know what gear we're using, what film we're shooting on, we just need somewhere to go. For this video, I'm going to go to Japan Festival Canada. It's an annual Japanese cultural event with performances, food stalls, and street vendors. And this year's festival is special because up on the stage, there will be a sumo grandmaster, Hakuho, one of the greatest sumo wrestlers of all time, having earned the prestigious title of Yokozuna. Yokozuna is the highest rank of sumo, and it's kind of like being top dog. My plan was to be like a stray dog, roam around the festival and see what photographs I could scavenge up. One thing we didn't touch on is why shoot in black and white? This is what Moriyama has to say. People often ask me about black and white photography. They inquire what I think of it, why the bulk of my work is in black and white, and where I see its main appeal. Because I like it, or because it looks sexy, are generally the best answers. But when the questioner wants to hear more, I usually add a little interpretation, suggesting that there's something dreamy about black and white, and that I appreciate its symbolically abstract quality. In the end, I think it all comes down to the fact that the things depicted in a black and white photograph generate the imagery and impact of a sort of alien scenery. Those who look at black and white photographs, including myself, don't see the concrete events they depict. From the start, these pictures hit us with their extraordinariness. Our understanding of imagery reduced to just black and white is immediately stimulated in our imagination and we experience a different reality through the encounter with an alien world. At least, this is what excites me about black and white. When doing any kind of photographic 
project, it's tempting to want to have a theme or message to your work. Moriyama rejects this approach. He says, When a photographer points his camera towards something and presses the shutter button, of course he does it with some kind of intention. But the image that is captured in that instant will always contain vastly more information than the person behind the camera had in mind. Any concept or theme the photographer might try to express will be utterly insignificant compared to the amount of information stored instantaneously in the image itself. This is similar to the discussion of the generosity of the camera in my video about George Giorgio. You have to abandon all delusions of control. That's not to say that intent or intention or intentionality isn't important, but Moriyama believes it is much more important at a baser, more instinctual level, at the level of desire. Instead of having a meticulous plan or shot list or thematic framework, you should follow your desire. Open your senses to the streets and photograph whatever catches your eye. In the words of Bruce Lee, don't think, feel. There is all the time in the world for others to analyze your photographs and make overly dramatic YouTube videos about their meaning. Moriyama explains, it's like a cast net. Your desire compels you to throw it out. You throw the net out and you snag whatever happens to come back. It was refreshing to be able to let go and photograph things I usually wouldn't photograph. I tried photographing with the viewfinder and then without it. Results were mixed. That's my uh, finger blocking the shot. Eventually, I reached the end of the road and I decided to turn back and head in the opposite direction. When photographing streets, Moriyama makes it a rule to walk up the street and then back down the same street. Because even though it's the same stretch of road, the angle of the light will change and so different shots will present themselves to you. Please feast your eyes on 
in the two screens beside me. in them while you're here. This was probably my favorite shot of the festival. It's grainy, blurry, and out of focus. I got the twin dogs in the frame, and by some stroke of luck, there was also a man holding a baby in the background. I could make some commentary on how we live in a society where pets are treated like babies, but Moriyama said making a definitive declaration of intent or meaning kills the photograph. In other words, instead of smothering art in meaning and interpretations, it's better to just let it breathe. So that was Japan Festival Canada. The nice thing about Toronto in the summer is that there's a different festival almost every weekend. So I was able to practice this style a bit more. Near one of these festivals, I came across a statue, which I think would definitely catch Moriyama's eye. Lips are a recurring motif in Moriyama's images. And if we were to get all analytical about it, we could say that they symbolize desire. If he were in this neighborhood, he would definitely stop and take a picture of this. 
With inanimate objects, Moriyama's approach is more slowed down. He tells his students, don't just select any old thing. Choose the object deliberately and carefully. Observe it closely. Give it your undivided attention first and only then capture it on camera. One thing I haven't discussed yet is Moriyama's use of flash. He often uses it on inanimate objects. So that's what I'm going to do using the Olympus XA's flash attachment. Here you can see the difference that flash makes. It can turn two front teeth into a smile worthy of your average Leica owner. I have a confession to make. The images in this video are not straight out of camera. Back when Moriyama shot on film, he did his editing in the darkroom. He was a skilled printer but unfortunately didn't keep notes. How he developed and printed some of his images is a mystery, even to Moriyama himself. His darkroom approach was spontaneous, like some sort of medium channeling creative inspiration into his prints. However, we can make some general observations of his images and try to imitate his darkroom work using Lightroom. I did some edits in Lightroom, adjusting the contrast, shadows, whites and blacks to get that gritty look reminiscent of Moriyama's early work. I also added in some grain and vignetting whenever I felt the pushing of the film didn't do enough. With these edits you can come closer to what Moriyama called encountering genuine reality. And here is the result. その本当に、いわゆる日本人がね、よく言う生まれて育って、みんながそこにいてっていうね、そういう意味でのそのふるさとっていうのはないからさ、もう子供の頃からボンボン変わってるし、だからいろんなイメージをね、勝手に自分で